if I had another kidney to spare, I would do it again in a heartbeat because mm -hmm. it is so, it's so doable. It's so incredibly doable. Welcome to Living Transplant, the podcast that takes you behind the scenes of the transplant program at Toronto General Hospital and brings you open and honest conversations about the transplant experience. My name is Candice, and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Centre for Living Organ Donation. I'm also a kidney transplant recipient. This is where I developed my passion to support others in their journey to navigate the world of transplant. Full disclosure, I'm not a physician, and I'm not here to give you medical advice. Think of me as your guide through the world of transplant to educate, inspire, pique your curiosity, and fuel your passion. Living Transplant will show you the world of transplant like you've never seen it before. Welcome back to the Living Transplant podcast. Today I'm joined by one of my fellow Great Actions models and kidney donor, Joanna. Later, we'll be joined by Dr. Sunita Singh, the Medical Director of the Living Kidney Donation Program at UHN. Thank you so much for co-hosting this episode with me. Thanks for having me. So I'm wondering if you can bring our listeners back to your childhood and tell me a little bit about what young you was like. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh, it goes way back, I guess. But I think... The young me was always interested in observing rather than leaning in too much or leaning into, obviously, I think. I was a pretty reserved kid who hung back a lot. And I think that kind of amplified after my mom passed away when we were when I was 12. Mm -hmm. And my siblings were, were all only a couple of years apart. So we were all quite young. I honestly don't remember much of my childhood before she passed, mm -hmm. but I remember how much it marked it after. And a lot of that was basically feeling... I don't know, comfortable watching people, observing. I think it eventually led to the work that I'm in, being a journalist and a storyteller. But as a kid, I think that was just my comfort zone. It was it was mm -hmm. really to kind of to watch as much as possible. And I guess, I guess absorb stuff that later helped me do the job that I do today. Mm -hmm. And so when did you know that you wanted to be a storyteller? When I was younger, I really loved, like I mentioned earlier, I, lo I loved watching people and analyzing them in my own mind. So when I was, you know, around 15, I would just decide I'm going to create an observation file on each member of my family. It's like kind of like no. a, just, <laughs> I, was a poor, I was a quirky kid. And it was just like, you know, and so-and-so seems to do this a lot. And so-and-so seems to react this way a lot. And I honestly did want to go into psychology. Um early days. Right. And it was, wow. you know, so, but it was, it was, again, it was more driven and, you know, this applies to any medium, be it a psychologist or a journalist, as I became just driven by curiosity and openness and wanting to understand what makes people tick and mm -hmm. what their own story is. And it dovetailed perfectly for me in that I became the official observer. That was my role. I was not center stage. They were, and I was really happy in that space because I, I do, find it even now I've been doing this job for like more than 25 years and I still find it completely fascinating to talk and meet new people and understand where they're coming from um mm -hmm. so yeah it's it started early in a not necessarily linear way but I think mm -hmm. it, it always had that common thread you know of just wanting to know more about people and where they came from mm -hmm. yeah. so listeners who don't know you what is that storytelling role that you do now well, I work for CBC Television. I work for the flagship news program, The National. And I started my career in Montreal in local news and then moved to Toronto about 20 years ago. And I was started off in Montreal. That's where I'm from. And since then, I basically do what we call current affairs in the business, which is essentially another way of saying taking deeper looks into issues that, you know, are, are, are much deeper, say, than your typical two minute news pro a news piece that I did for many, many, many years before mm -hmm. I kind of segued into this part. So it's uh, super fulfilling and it remains challenging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not the kind of job that you ever sit on your laurels. If you do, I think it's really time to kind of, you can't get too comfortable because that's basically mm -hmm. what takes away the, the joy of it. But uh, yeah, so that's what I do. And do you have a favorite story that you've done in the past or something that really challenged you more than something else? You know, I mean, I'm sure we can we, we can talk about my own story about my kidney journey for sure. And that one was very exceptional for me mm -hmm. on many levels. And that was 
you know, I think it will be a standout forever for me because it was very different in many ways. I mean, I have a lot of stories that I look back on and think, wow, that was a, what a great experience. And I think this story was just so unusual because I was, as I mentioned, always the observer and the narrator and the recounter of what was happening in somebody else's life. And in this case, I put myself in there. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, partly because, uh, mostly because I felt my story was a bigger story, that it had, there was a public service element to it, Mm -hmm. that public broadcasting is really, that's the basis of it. And I felt that it was one way to kind of highlight an issue that had touched my family and is continued continues to affect my family, but affects so many more people. And that's something that I came to appreciate in my own journey as becoming a living donor, mm-hmm. talking to the experts, talking to people around you, how many people are in these situations, right? And I thought that would be a way to pay it forward, if you will, and to, mm-hmm. to just give people that glimpse into, hey, it's not so hard. <laughs> Look at me, I'm fine. And this is what it's about. And, and I think a lot of it was informed by the fact that I was quite ignorant. I had did not know much about living donation and organ donation. And I realized if I don't know much, and I really do spend a lot of time reading all sorts of stuff. Mm-hmm. If I don't know much, how much is the average Canadian going to know about it? And how much will the average person know how deeply they can affect somebody with a relatively, relatively small gesture, because I don't Mm -hmm. think organ donation, as I came to appreciate, is as enormous and overwhelming as it felt like when I first started my journey. So I think I wanted to share that. And that's what that story for sure, which was earlier this year in June, Mm -hmm. June. Yeah, it was two months after my surgery. I think that story is probably the most special. Wow. Thinking about that journey and uh what you went through. Can you tell me a little bit about your family and how your family has been affected by kidney disease? It's a pretty recent revelation for us. My mom passed away when I was 12. Mm -hmm. We didn't really know what had happened. I think the narrative was it was an aneurysm, a stroke, high blood pressure. We just didn't know. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we continued on and it was only in my Um, when my brother and my sister were in their 40s that by chance my brother was diagnosed it was because he had his kids were they were playing one of the kids kicked him and he was in a lot of pain and he got it checked and the scan revealed that he had PKD polycystic kidney disease and when he was diagnosed the doctor said this is something that runs in families 50 percent chance of inheriting it from a parent who has the gene so he immediately called my sister and I and said this is what just happened you guys need to get checked Wow. My sister got checked and it was revealed that she also had it. And I got a scan and I didn't. And then it was like, what now? All of us kind of put it on the back burner because as my brother would say up right up until his kidneys crashed last year, it was, he felt fine and he was active and he was healthy and he very active life, three little kids. And I think there was obviously monitoring, but I don't think the, the ticking to that point where you needed a transplant really happened until it was quite sudden Mm -hmm. so I think for all of us we just felt okay there's a real possibility that you'll just live with this for the rest of your life Mm -hmm. and nothing more will need to be done you just have to be careful with your diet and your lifestyle but transplant the drama or the (laughs) hugeness of that concept just did not become a reality until quite suddenly and I think that contributed to the shock that we all kind of went through when it did get to that point how did he find Um, out that he was at that point it was an episode that lasted a period of several weeks Mm -hmm. and it started with one of his regular checkups his kidney function had dropped and he was given some kind of treatment that is often used to kind of help regulate or to at least stall the decline Mm -hmm. in function and it had the opposite effect and which i understood later is when you're at a certain point and your kidneys are that vulnerable they could react badly to anything, Mm -hmm. even if it's a treatment meant to help. Mm -hmm. So in his case, he was feeling really unwell and just really weak and could barely walk. And Mm -hmm. it was just this kind of what is happening. And then he finally was admitted to hospital and was put on dialysis while in hospital. So it Mm -hmm. was all very, I'm not feeling well. I'm feeling worse. Wait, I'm feeling a bit better. No, it's not getting better. And we're like, something is happening because it was just Mm -hmm. not the trajectory was just not going in a good way. Mm-hmm. And then finally, when he was admitted, he went through emergency one day because he was just feeling so terrible that uh, his function had dropped 
gosh, I don't even know. I think it was like 9%. And he was put on dialysis. And, and after that, stayed on dialysis for six months until the transplant surgery. Wow. When he was in hospital and they put him on dialysis, did they talk to him about the need for transplant and how that was going to be in his future? Or how was that topic brought up to him and your family? You know, it was brought up in the course of him being monitored because the number that I came to understand later was that when you're at about 15% of function, that's when the conversation about transplant kicks in. And I always thought, because there is a possibility too, that you can just chug along at 15% for years. It was, it was just really in the back of our minds because he felt good up until mm-hmm. his episode, he was fine. It was in the course of it that it was a theoretical thing, quite real. And it was inching closer because of his function. And we had that conversation before he went to hospital and he said, they're talking to me about transplant. I'm like, transplant, what does that mean? Do you get on a list? What happens? He goes, no, they're thinking of a living donor. Mm -hmm. Like a living donor. Oh my God, what what do you think? And he goes, would you, do you think, and it was not like an ask. It was more like in the form of the conversation that I didn't even know I could be suitable because I didn't Mm -hmm. even know anything about living donors. So he said, maybe you could. And I'm like, okay, what do I need to do? And he's like, well, the difficulty of his blood type, he has type O, we're all type O. It's a smaller pool of people. Type mm-hmm. O are universal donors, but the recipients can only receive from O. So automatically him being on a deceased donors list created a huge wait list. Yes. So, and I'm sure we'll get into why it's better to be get a, an organ from a living donor, but that blood type issue was the more pressing one right away. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even know what blood type I was, right? My, I think <laughs> most people walk around going, I don't know, am I A, B? I don't know. Right. And I really remember having that conversation. This was shortly before he was admitted to hospital and thinking, where would I have my blood type info? And then I thought, oh my gosh, my kid's birth records. I found those and I called him right away. I'm like, oh my God, I'm O, I'm O. And we were just like, okay, great. I'm going to call the transplant lady tomorrow and we'll start the process. And This was again, before he went to hospital, it was again, well, maybe you're going to need a transplant in a few months or whatever, but we'll start. And and literally a few days later, he was admitted. So when I went to see him in hospital in Montreal, I called the donor coordinator. I said, I'm going to be there anyway. Tell me what I can do to get this ball rolling since I'm happy to keep coming to Montreal to do it, to condense the tests or make the process simpler. So it all started, honestly, there was like, we went from zero to a hundred in a matter of a day. Right. And so it was, yeah, it was a lot. It was definitely a lot. When you say you started that process, can you explain to us the process that you went through to become a donor and then also demystify some of those fears that us recipients have about our loved ones going through this? Yeah, for sure. I think the number one most reassuring thing that I heard off the bat before we even started the assessment process was people can have a perfectly normal life with one kidney and you don't have to really do anything different with your life after the fact and that you will only be approved if you're healthy enough and that where there is very little risk to you and I say little in terms of every surgery has an inherent risk but Mm -hmm. there's no risk to doing this surgery your life will not be put in danger after that fact. You're not going to have a different life really other other than the caveat of avoid contact sports because you want to protect your one kidney and don't gain a lot of weight because you don't want to increase your blood pressure and therefore put the pressure on your kidney, that kind of stuff, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of, no, I didn't have a career in football and it wasn't planning to, and (laughs) honestly staying healthy. I mean, I think that's just added motivation. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think to your point, there's a lot of worry. And I think there's a lot of fear, obviously, for the recipient because they're going through this crisis, right? Mm -hmm. And they're afraid for themselves, their health and what it's going to mean for their future. I think there's so little space for anything other than worry. They're worried about themselves. They're worried about you. They're worried about their family. They're worried about everything. Mm -hmm. I think I helped ease my brother a little bit by basically saying, great news, guys. I just talked to so-and-so and and this is what she said. And I think it kind of just took the down a bit. We all kind of exhaled a bit. And I said, it sounds like it's easy peasy. And I had no idea. And honestly, it was a big eye-opening moment for me because I honestly was, I remember calling her thinking, okay, tell me about what does this mean? She's like, well, blah, 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 blah. And it was just so, oh, okay. That's okay. I can do that. I can do that. No problem. And it demystified the idea of the word transplant, which inherently sounds scary, 
organ donate donating it just all those words are so loaded and i think loaded mm-hmm. because we don't hear them enough because it's not in everybody's mind until it suddenly affects your family but it felt okay when i realized how accessible it was in the sense that you, you go through it you get out of the surgeries are routinely successful not usually mm-hmm. not hopefully routinely successful and your recovery is minimal and then i thought well why don't people know this then i had no idea that it was relatively easy right that helped ease a lot of worry for mm-hmm. myself and for my brother for sure mm-hmm. we talk a lot about the process of what you go through physically with your work up with the blood work and the scans making sure that physically that you're okay what were some of the implications that you went through emotionally through this process and then eventually after donating you don't want to be in it that's really where it comes down to you don't want to be doing this because you don't want your sibling or the person you love to need an organ i think that was the start of like i can't believe this is our story and then once you get past that because you have to get past that fairly quickly it was okay so this is our story and hey there's actually a solution and we were very very lucky because not everybody has a solution right you hear about other kinds of illnesses that just don't have something that could help so dramatically so that quickly became my lens but it took a little bit of time and throughout the time i, I was often sitting in these waiting rooms waiting for the next test or the other thinking oh my god i can't believe i'm here I can't believe I'm in this unit transplant unit it just felt surreal many times and I think covid added to it because it was so isolating you couldn't have anybody with you I was traveling to Montreal to do the tests there because it just meant it would be faster than them having to coordinate with Toronto and I was happy to go cuz it gave me an opportunity to see my brother and the rest other members of my family so it worked out on our end very well but it did mean these you're on these trips you're on these trains or planes and you're kind of going where am i going and a lot of it was i'm just going to get there and get through this and i didn't really open my mind beyond that because i didn't want to think about more than the, just the next step and i know donors that i've spoken to since all talk about the same thing that you're kind of thinking things are going along because they're not really telling you okay so that went well and now we're moving on they're just booking you for your next test mm-hmm. um, so it starts with the immediate okay what's your blood type are you compatible are there antibodies and then the barrage of questionnaires i had no idea there were so many questions that and then obviously the tests themselves so i would say that it is and it was a very existential and emotionally exo- exhausting process because you're there because you're trying to help somebody Mm-hmm. um by giving a life-saving organ that you know, of yours and it's hopeful and it's optimistic but it's still scary and it's you're also going down the road of they're going to comb you from head to toe oh my god what if they find something what if something's wrong with me because you don't go through that kind of physical scrutiny on your normal day to day so there's a lot there's a lot going on at the same time so i would definitely say it was uh, at moments overwhelming Mm-hmm. I was on at the cafeteria at the hospital in between waiting to go from one test to the next and I think I I just must have looked so dejected and overwhelmed because I was just sitting there with my mask and taking bites and sips of my coffee in between my mask cuz it was full covid rage right and you could barely take off your mask and this this hospital worker just came up from behind me and put his hand on my shoulder and he said it's all going to be okay and then he just walked away I thought of him even though I could never place him cuz it just it was so quick I thought of him when I was on the train heading to Montreal for the surgery. I just thought that was an angel in whatever form, whatever your beliefs are. There was a it was a spiritual moment of a reassurance because mm-hmm. there was nothing overtly distraught about me sitting there, but I he felt it. He obviously sensed it, right? And it was it was just that little boost that I thought, "Oh, you know, it will, okay. Buckle buckle up. We'll, we'll get through the next test and then we'll wait for the next round." And yeah, it was it was a lot it was a lot and in terms of post surgery elation that he was over elation that hit the kidney had kicked in and then the kind of ups and downs of the recovery which were not expected and i think because my surgeon did mention a lot of her patients were reporting that they were having these ups and downs that i was a little bit braced for it so it did help because it did bring us back to where did this come from it must have been our mom right because my dad doesn't have pkd 
Right. And then he kind of helped us understand, okay, so that's why she died. She died because she probably had a stroke or a heart attack related to high blood pressure related to her kidney function. And she mm -hmm. probably would never have known about that because maybe the tests back then in the mid seventies or late seventies, when she passed, were probably, I don't, she was never diagnosed. We had no idea. So mm -hmm. it just made us, there was a lot going on. It was a lot of hope and optimism, understanding why our mom had passed and also the added layer of knowing that my sister also needs a transplant. So yeah. it remains a lot. It remains a lot. But I think in those first couple of months, it was just felt very, very concentrated. And you, you're basically mm -hmm. healing. So you have time to to kind of let it settle as mm -hmm. a, you're not overly necessarily analyzing it, but it's settling in you. And it's, uh, it's a lot for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, you have that post transplant time where you have to be taking care of yourself and not being your traditional busy, busy human. So you have to sit and ruminate in those thoughts and feelings, right? I think the whole point of these journeys is that you can't shortcut it, right? And mm -hmm. I think the healing and the forcing you to kind of sit back and absorb it is it, it kind of just absorbs. It's not even I can't even say it was even logical or rational, but it was mm -hmm. just all these feelings that were, that kept going through. Part of me was so relieved that the process itself was over that the, and that the surgery was over. Cause that took a huge weight of, like I've been living with this thing on my shoulder for months, waiting for it to happen, waiting to find out if it was even going to happen. It was a surreal moment when my brother and I drove, we drove ourselves to the hospital to have a transplant surgery. It's just so, it's just so bizarre, right? 6 a.m. We're driving in these empty streets to Montreal going, okay, so mine is at eight and then yours will be at 12 and I'll talk to you later. It's kind of great because this is modern medicine and how accessible it is, mm -hmm. um, but it's surreal. It was so many layers of emotions that eventually after the surgery, it felt like a weight was lifted, but then just a new kind of heavier thing settled in. And it's just, honestly, I think I would say it's only now kind of lifting because you go back to that initial spot where you're going, okay, this is optimistic. This is good. And now mm -hmm. I'm transferring that energy for my sister, who I hope will have obviously the same outcome as my brother. And mm -hmm. I've told her and I've said it in my report, if I had another kidney to spare, I would do it again in a heartbeat because mm -hmm. it is so, it's so doable. It's so incredibly doable. Wow. So you're in the height of COVID. What was that like to drive together to the hospital and then say your goodbyes to your brother. Yeah. You know, it was even the two weeks preceding it, when we got our surgery date, mm -hmm. I just turned to all my, everybody in the house. I said, you are, you're not allowed to go anywhere without a mask. At that point it was, we were in that lull between waves. I also knew that I needed to have a negative COVID test for the surgery. Right. And I just thought of all the steps, all the organizing to get us both into that hospital that day and I thought I'm not going to mess this up mm -hmm. because my kids are hanging out with friends you know even though we're all vaccinated and had, sure. all, had all the boosts there's just no way so I think mm -hmm. to my family's credit they were good the kids were kind of grumbling about it but I'm like listen guys this is huge this is huge and we have to really do our best COVID was weird because it meant the process was really isolating and I was at all these appointments on my own because they didn't want anybody they just really wanted to keep it pared down which made total sense mm -hmm. and then it was this little window of the lull in COVID that our surgeries happened because they had been canceling surgeries right transplant surgeries early days so <laughs> things had started to kick back up just when my brother needed it which is also another blessing and then we're driving <laughs> with our masks on to the hospital my husband was driving us and mm -hmm. drop this off and he's going to park the car. Okay. See you later. It felt surreal because it was just so meh. This is here we go here. Let's get started. And, mm -hmm. and then we had that moment just before I'm like, okay, I'll see you on the other side. Right. So yeah, it, it worked out. It worked out. I think that's part of the beauty that it is that accessible. Mm -hmm. Here you go. Kidney recipient, kidney donor are driving themselves to the hospital and we'll talk several hours later, but yeah. it was done. Yeah. It was done. And were you able to see him shortly after your surgery? Yeah, we were in recovery for several hours. And because his surgery was after mine, he was still kind of coming out of the anesthesia and more recovery. But his doctor came to see me, the surgeons, our team of surgeons were kind of shuffling. Mm -hmm. They're saying it's all working. The kidney kicked in right away. Everything looks good. And it was just like, hallelujah. It was like, wow. So it was just, I could have stayed there happily for many more hours because it was done and I knew he was right next to me behind that curtain 
doing well. And when they finally sent me off to my room, they wheeled me by him and he had just woken up. And I remember we were waving at each other. I'm oh like, are you good? I'm good. And I'll see you upstairs. Cause we're all, we were both on the same floor, but in different ways. So yeah, it was, yeah, it's very special, very special for sure. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. In a short few hours that can, can happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So you talked about your brother having kids and and you have kids as well. How did your family feel about you being your brother's donor? You know, they, I think there was trepidation at first, but the more I understood about the process and the more I relayed that to them, everyone was reassured. And like I mentioned to them, I I have three kids. My brother has three kids. We all have three kids. My sister has three kids. (laughs) You understand what's at stake, right? You understand that it's not just your decision, but it's going to affect your family. And I remember shortly after and very quickly after speaking with the coordinator in Montreal, I understood how there's so many safeguards in place for the donor, Mm -hmm. so many checks and balances along the way, and ultimately they won't let you go through it unless they think you're healthy enough. So right. that was a huge sense of, uh, it just calmed everybody down. It calmed me down for sure. And that allowed me to calm them down. Mm-hmm. And I think I just kept framing it as this is amazing. We can do this. Isn't it great that we can do this? And right. so that was kind of the mood. And I remember when I came back from Montreal, I'd spent a week there because the recommendation was not to travel for several days, just in case of blood clots and stuff. They want you around and moving around and not stuck in a car or yeah. even. So I came back home about a week after and I FaceTimed them right away. And they mm-hmm. were like, it doesn't look like you had surgery. <laughs> I'm like, I know, right? It's I'm <laughs> shuffling a little bit because I'm it's still a little bit. Longer, <laughs> but otherwise, I, I felt fine. I really, you know, you're tired and your body adjusts eventually. But they were just like, wow, that looks like you ne- like nothing ever happened. I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. and that's the point. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? I mean, obviously, you're altered mentally and yes. even physically. But it was, I think, because I just chose and I, and I do use that word deliberately, I chose to look at it as an incredible opportunity to be able to help. Mm-hmm. Because I think I would have been much more stressed if I was on the sidelines and not doing something. So I remember his doctor came to see us in recovery and he said, you know, you're a hero for doing this, but I'm like, no, (laughs) it's a lot easier to do something. Um, Mm -hmm. There's very little harm to you. And yet it's an incredibly profound effect on somebody else. So that's not a hero to me. I think that's a gift. That's, that's incredible to have that opportunity. And that's the way I looked at it. It kept me going Mm -hmm. through the process and it kept me going obviously through the surgery. And when I, and I think it, it added to the, to my household being kind of like, Hey, well, you're back. Okay. Like it was not a huge deal, which is great. Right. right? Yeah. 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 I think Just, they got impressed when they saw the poster at, on the, the subway platform. They're going, Oh, wow. I'm like, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's an Oregon kids. I gave an Oregon and this is what happened. <laughs> it's called transplant, but I love the fact that they weren't kind of shocked or scared about it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That mom did this amazing thing, but for them, they're like, ah, she's gone a little while. She's back. Mom's yeah, back. Off we go. Yeah, back. But also for them, because maybe, maybe one day they could be one, right? Maybe they could be a donor. I mean, the point is to demystify it, not just for ourselves and to get through a very stressful period. There's just an incredible amount of uh, the impact that you can make on somebody's life on with so little impact on yours. I just think it's like a no brainer, right? I just, mm-hmm. and I didn't know, I didn't know. So that's why I put it out there because I think the more people know about that, hopefully they become more encouraged to, to step up and help somebody. It's amazing. Speaking of your children, this is a difficult question to answer for some, but we have a lot of people who have adult children who would like to donate to them. But often they're very nervous about that, thinking, what if their children need a kidney in the future or part of their liver? You know what? I think I looked at it from the perspective of I had the luxury of knowing that because I didn't carry the gene, my kids wouldn't get it. Mm -hmm. So they're not in imminent danger or even in theoretically future danger, because not everybody with PKD is going to need a transplant. There was no risk of them developing it anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different consideration for me. And I maybe it would have been a much harder one if that was the case, but and then if I, it was, I wouldn't be a donor, right? Because right. my kidneys were okay. So I was able to, I know in my sister's case, for example, because her kids are adults, young, young adults, 
and I know their conversations with the, with her team that they might develop it later in life. So they're mm -hmm. immediately ruled out. So there's all, I mean, in some ways the decision is made for you just by what are the possibilities, right? Either you're unsuitable or they might be unsuitable. As for the theoretical risk of somebody needing an organ down the road, I honestly believe you pay it, it comes back, right? I think mm -hmm. there was no imminent danger. There was no reason not to physically, mm -hmm. right? And I think, I pray, I hope, and I truly, truly believe that when you do something that can help somebody, there will it'll come back. It'll come back. Mm -hmm. There'll be some kind of energy that comes back to all of us. And I, I truly believe that. I think it carried me through the process and it will carry me forward. And I, I'm very, very mindful of my own health, more so than I was before, mm -hmm. even more so, and, but not in a way that is, that is overwhelming or kind of fear-based. It was a, a reminder that life is precious and our role on this earth is to, I honestly believe it's to help. And if you can help, gosh, that's what, what a, it makes you lucky. It makes you so, if I feel lucky, I don't feel like a hero, which is really nice. I mean, I don't take it away from them. I think it's beautiful to hear it, but I just feel lucky that I was able to help. And by extension, my kids will will see an example, even though they're kind of like, man, oh yeah, did you do what was what was that thing that you did? But I think even by osmosis, I don't want to overdo it on them because I don't want to overplay it. But I just want them to see, look, you can do something, right? Mm -hmm. And when you can, step up because everybody always needs help in some form or another. So I'm just happy I was able to. Mm -hmm. And you've spoken about this already, but can you tell me a little bit about? What did donating the kidney mean to you personally? It meant helping my brother very directly. Mm -hmm. And it meant uh, demystifying the process for my sister too, who was in that very unenviable position of being in the hospital that night and having two of her siblings in, in surgery. And we knew it was going to be okay. I remember telling her, it's going to be fine. I feel it. I feel it. And, but it's, it's scary for her and scary because she know she was also going to, she is going to also be in that position. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it was really an incredible opportunity to help. And I think it helped her see, and she told me this after when we talked about it, it helped her see that it wasn't so scary. It wasn't, mm -hmm. we did it. We're almost like the blueprint. So now even for her, it's, we've demystified the transplant process for her too. And for anybody who's, and for the, the donor that will step up for her. I've had conversations with people since I, the story went out, the report, I was, and I was happy to take all of them. People who were thinking about becoming a donor, people who had, were about to become a donor. It was so completely gratifying to me to share my story and to talk about how you're going to be okay. Cause they were like, when did you do your surgery again? It's funny. People watch the report and they, they don't quite uh, catch the timeline. I'm like, it was, that was two months ago. And they're like, what, what? That was two months ago. <laughs> they're like, yes. And that is not unusual. I'm not like some superwoman. That's typical. Mm -hmm. So I think it was really just to help my brother and to help my sister by extension. And then the story was, I put the story out there to help anybody else. It was the biggest lesson was how easy it is to help somebody and how important it is to demystify the process. It wasn't not only for myself and for my family, but for the general public. And, mm -hmm. and because of the platform that I'm able, I'm able to share that story with the support of the network who were open and happy to air that kind of story. Cause it is unusual and we don't usually put our ourselves in our own stories. So right. in that way, it was all a very kind of dovetailed really well a lot of people who reached out to share their own stories and to also talk about their own journeys and to talk and some even said I'm considering being a donor after I saw that and I thought well that's incredible do it and if you have any questions obviously feel free and also know that either it's a road being a, a donor right and they're no and they're there to protect you the process is there to protect you as a donor so there's no sense of pressure at all there's no sense of you've got to do this in fact it's the opposite you know you don't have to do this and you can pull out at any time so there's a lot of i think so many safeguards along the way that that i think it really reassures everybody in the process especially the donor that they're doing something that they're mentally okay with and physically of course okay with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are always telling other people's stories. <laughs> what has it been like today and through the Great Actions campaign and your story on CBC actually having questions asked to you? 
it felt surprisingly natural, despite the fact that it is completely out of character and out of what I do. <laughs> but this one felt natural. And because I think the key is it just, the story was bigger than me. I was just the vehicle. And if I could be a vehicle and, and walk that line between awareness and not be an advocate, because that's not my role as a journalist to be an advocate. It is mm -hmm. to raise awareness. And in this case, I used myself as a device. And it felt natural and it felt right because I came at it from, you know, years of being a journalist. So I know not to sensationalize mm -hmm. and I, the trust that the network has in me to support that. So there was definitely a lot of care put into that piece. Um, and mm -hmm. the team that I work with are incredible. And uh, we thought about everything and we were very careful. We were very careful to kind of make sure that this is a story about awareness and mm -hmm. it's not about telling people out there you've got to be a donor no but if you do want to be one guess what maybe you didn't even think of it maybe you wouldn't have never thought about it until now and these are the issues and these are the bigger issues why we could all step up and uh, I think it wasn't that hard surprisingly it was different but I almost felt like it was a public service and that's what our stories mostly are they they tend to be and they have to be, by definition, bigger than us, and they have to be relevant to people. So I felt that this was something that was hugely relevant to people who were not only on the list for deceased donors, but primarily people living around us who don't realize that, as I initially thought automatically, oh, does this mean that you have to be put on a list? I didn't realize that he could have a living donor and, and how much better that is in terms of outcomes for everybody. It met the bar. And I was just very careful to, to tell it in a way that respected the fact that this is not about preaching to anybody, but it's about informing people about something that you might know very little about, as I knew very little before, <laughs> before my, my scars <laughs> settled in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you talked about your scars. We showcased a lot of those scars in our Great Actions campaign. Can you let those listeners who haven't watched your video yet know a little bit about your scars and those marks and what they mean to you? Sure. Another key thing about these surgeries are it's mostly laparoscopic, right? So there's mm -hmm. tiny incisions that are made to basically separate the kidney from the vessels. And then there's a larger incision made to remove it carefully. The larger incision was on my cesarean section where I had twins. And so that was a that was an old scar. So that was not a big deal. And then there's all these little guys, laparoscopic ones. And I swear, I look at them and I smile every time I look at them because I think they're just such a great reminder of what happened. Because most days I don't think about the fact that I did this because I feel fine. I feel great. And every time I call my brother to see how he's doing and how did your latest doctor appointment go? Yes, it comes back to me, but it's almost removed. Like it didn't happen to me because there's really so little physical evidence left after other than the scars. So the scars are great. See them as incredible reminders of hope, of love, of optimism, of all these little tiny little things. And that's, that's all that's left of it all, right? Physically. And I remind myself, and I know it's kind of corny, but I thank the, my remaining kidney for kicking in and doing double the work. And I thank my other kidney and I'm automatically kind of touching either side as we're talking, but I always thank my left kidney for going and doing its work. And I almost kind of feel like it's part of it is still there. It's like this little ghost thing, but I think it's great. I think it's incredible. I look at those scars and I think of that campaign of, of what a great idea to kind of frame something that people intuitively think is bad, like a scar and frame it in such a, in, in such a hopeful and empowering way. And there's a lot of it is about empowering because as I mentioned earlier, to me, it was much, much easier however scary and big and different that world of transplant was, it was much easier to be on that road than sitting on the sidelines and hoping something was going to work out. So I'm having a much harder time with my sister's situation because I can't step in, but I am helping her by obviously by showing her what happened with my brother and I. And if there have been a couple of people who've stepped up for her and I've had conversations with them about what to expect and what, what the process is like, I'm doing my bit as much as possible because I do think it's, it's easier to help for me mm -hmm. anyway, much, much easier than to sit. For sure. Yeah. You've been through this process and thankfully your brother and, and you are both doing great. For those people who are on that 
journey, like you said, you've talked to a couple pr prospective donors. Do you have any advice that you would give to people who are thinking about potentially donating to someone, either anonymously or someone that they know? Yeah, I think it's uh, one, it's always comes back to demystifying the process and, mm -hmm. and how routine transplants have become. And mm -hmm. that's an incredible thing, right? Um, and how routinely successful they are and and how fulfilling it is personally and emotionally for a donor. I don't think anybody wants to go have surgery. It's just not something that you're going, sure, let's do this, but it's, but you're doing it for a different reason. And I, you know, we've talked about it before, but the energy around the team of surgeons and anesthetists and residents at our surgeries was palpable because it was just, it was, it was optimistic and it was happy. And it was, mm -hmm. you know, you, underneath the masks, you saw that they were smiling, right? Because they, I remember when we talked about it, they said, you know, it's like you, you're doing a surgery that, you know, is inherently going to help somebody, right? It's almost like a happy surgery. And mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure if that's an awkward way to phrase it, but there's something really, really, um, that carries you this joyfulness that carries you as you're being wheeled in that it just it just felt surreal and happy at the same time it's very strange but I think I, that's what I frame it as as much as possible I frame it as authentically as I can based on my experience because I don't want to sell anything to anybody but right. I will definitely definitely sell without you know without peddling <laughs> the reality which is that it's relatively easy and you're going to end up a better person and you're already a good person for trying. I think that's kind of goes without saying, but I think it, there's something really satisfying about being able to help somebody as well and humbling too. It's a really strange mix of emotions, but it, it leaves you a better person. No doubt. Mm -hmm. I think it comes back to really ordinary people. And I count myself among ordinary people can do extraordinary things without without much of anything, like without much of, of a sacrifice, you know? And I think like you mentioned, and it's really good, legitimate questions. There's fear, fear for yourself, fear for your family. And there's so much heaviness around that. If you just laser focus on what is this about at the end of the day, how often do you have the opportunity to save somebody's life? Like truly physically, practically save somebody's life, or at the very least improve their quality of life. My brother was on dialysis three times a week. If he didn't have a kidney for me or another living donor, he'd probably be waiting because of his blood type five years or so, right? And there's the paired donation program, which is also an amazing thing that I was willing to do. If I was not a match for him, I was 100% going to give up a kidney to get another kidney paired to him, mm -hmm. which just even that model is also so incredibly optimistic. I think that's what I would leave people with, uh, that it's it's not what you expect. You don't expect your life to take you down these roads. Nobody ever does. Mm -hmm. But when you're on it, it can be incredibly empowering and fulfilling and humbling, hugely humbling, because you're talking about life and you're facing life and death for several weeks that's on your mind. And then when it happens, you're like, and that was it. And you never quite left the same, but that's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I'd say, you know, if you're in the market for <laughs> doing something good and feeling okay afterwards and doing something extraordinary to somebody's life, I think many, many people should at least consider it at least, you know, kind of ask the questions. I'm happy to always share. And I think what you're doing is great because it's putting it out there. It's putting people's stories out there, including your own. And people see you and they hear you and they see that, you know, look, you're good and I'm good. And you know what? Why not? Why not? Why not help somebody? Why not? When fear stops people from doing stuff, I don't think they end up any better off. And there's something very corrosive about fear and it undermines your own sense of happiness, even if it's initially makes you feel safer. So I think it was a leap in many ways and it, and brave because the definition of bravery is to do something that scares you and getting through it anyway. And I just think you're left off better. You're left better at the end of it for yourself. And I think, especially for my kids, I want them to see that as a model of how they might somehow one day step up in any other way for somebody. So speaking about prospective donors and the donor process, I would like to invite Dr. Sunita Singh to join our conversation today. Dr. Sunita Singh is a transplant nephrologist and medical director of the Living Kidney Donation Program here at UHN. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I'm wondering if you could tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, sure. So as you mentioned, I work here at UHN. I actually wear two hats. I'm not only a transplant nephrologist, but a donor nephrologist. So on some days I'm looking after kidney donors and other days I'm looking after transplant recipients. And I'm the medical director here of the Living Donation Program at UHN. I'm a trained nephrologist, trained internist, and of course, with expertise in transplantation and donation. And I'm also a clinician investigator. So I spend not only my time looking after patients, but also participate in research. So it's a really exciting thing to do because you get to do a little bit of everything. Well, what interested you, Dr. Singh, in nephrology and in transplant specifically? Yeah, it's a great question. I've been asked that so many times. Initially, Mm -hmm. nephrology, I just uh, thought was very interesting and fascinated how this like small organ or these small organs, most of us have two, could do so much, you know, filter blood, get rid of kind of toxins, handle salts and minerals. Like I just found that kind of really fascinating. But transplant really was a whole different experience. And it really has the possibility to completely change somebody's life. And that is what really attracted me to it. When I have a mentor who used to say, there's only like two good reasons to come to a hospital. One is to have a baby and one is to have a transplant. And I think that is very true. You know, you can, you are part of something in nephrology and, but also as part of the patient journey that really changes quality of life, survival, but it's a huge transformative experience. And there's very few things that, that do that. And transplant is one of them. And it was really fascinating to be part of that, humbling to be part of that, and just really a great experience to be part of that transformation for people. So that's really what, it, what it attracted me to transplantation specifically. And I am very grateful to say I have done both. So two happy hospital occasions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about what, and, and this may not be a question that you can even answer because it might not exist, but what an average day would look like in your job? Yeah. So an average day, as you insinuated, <laughs> you're not at all the same day to day, but in terms of a typical day, as typical as they get, a lot of times I'm reviewing information about donors who are in the evaluation process. So people who have submitted their questionnaires were wanting to be evaluated. They have to go through obviously a stepwise process through that evaluation. We're reviewing all of the test results as we go through the evaluation. So I'm doing a lot of that. I have clinics where I see donors face-to-face for an assessment of their suitability, discussing their specific individual risks. And then the days that I'm on call, I'm also seeing transplant recipients who are admitted. We have a a ward here where patients are admitted. Some of them are getting a a new transplant or a new kidney. So either from a deceased donor or living donor, some of them are admitted for complications that we need to manage. And then in there also is ongoing research work, which was meeting with our research teams, meeting with collaborators across the country. Most days are kind of a combination of all of those things, never in the same order. And of course, sometimes emergencies happen. Today, we had something that kind of came out of left field that we needed to address and those things happen. And, and that's part of uh, part of transplantation. It's never, <laughs> never dull and never boring. Uh, and it's really also quite challenging to always be faced with different scenarios. I always say in when I evaluate donors, there's so many different scenarios that come up that you just deal with as you face them that you may have never seen before. So, mm-hmm. so those are things that kind of keep it fresh and exciting. Touching on that, because having gone through it myself as a donor, can you spell out a little bit from your medical perspective, what the assessment process is like for a potential organ donor for kidney? For sure. I think for most people, it's a process that depending on how you view it, it can be very fast or very long, depending on on who you are as an individual. So everybody kind of goes through the evaluation process with different expectations. But the biggest thing is people want to get through it and want to have an answer 
as soon as possible. So we do try to get people through that evaluation as soon as possible. It can be a lot of anxiety along the way, but really it starts with first submitting a questionnaire of your general health, kind of yes, no questions, just to get a sense. Is there anything here that's that absolutely stops us from proceeding from a safety perspective? So examples would be somebody with active cancer or diabetes. These are things that really would stop an evaluation from even starting. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the questionnaire looks good and the overall health of the individual is, is good. And again, just to highlight, people don't have to be in perfect health. They have to be in good health, but we can work with some medical conditions for sure. They then go on to the next step of the evaluation, which would be basic laboratory testing. We're not only looking at overall health with those tests, but specifically we're really honing in and trying to make sure that kidney function is okay, mm -hmm. obviously, which makes total sense since we're talking about taking one kidney out. Okay. Um, and then we have to go through subsequently imaging testing. So making sure that when we're imaging the whole body, that we don't see anything unusual. And also that surgically, that the kidney can actually technically be removed mm -hmm. and implanted into somebody else. So that's an aspect as well that we have to consider. And also adding to that, the cross match, the infamous cross match that people are often kind of holding their breath, right? Mm -hmm. Am I going to be compatible with my recipient? Will I be able to donate directly to them? And fortunately, we have avenues for compatible and incompatible people. So there's options really for everybody, but that is also part of the process. And then we finally get to clearance. So the whole process, of course, at any point in time, we might discover something mm -hmm. um, that may make someone ineligible. It can be very anxiety provoking for a lot of people as they're waiting through. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, But sometimes we don't, clear someone, and that can be extremely disappointing and of course, heartbreaking for people. But sometimes we find things in the evaluation that of course makes them ineligible, but has by virtue of them going through the donor process has saved their life. So wow. we found early cancers on CT before, and although you can't donate on the, other, on the flip side, had you never done this testing, you may never have found this, right? So sometimes that happens and it's tough, all scenarios, when we can't get through to a final clearance or difficult, but sometimes there are some silver lining in some cases where we do find some early things that we can address that otherwise would have never been captured. Right. You spoke a little bit about those contraindications for donors. Are there any one single thing or a couple things that would say, absolutely, no, we're not even going to start this process because you're not really healthy enough to go through this? Yeah, it's a really good question. So whenever we look at a donor, what we're ultimately, our goal here is to be able to get donors through this process and we want it to be safe. Mm -hmm. And so that's where all of these criteria come from is ultimately our focus is donor safety because we want to be able to help someone in need, mm -hmm. but for the person who is helping for that risk to stay low. And so there's certain medical conditions that significantly change the risk to the donor, which is why we say no from the get-go. For example, type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes. We know diabetes is the number one cause of kidney failure in Canada. So it, it certainly is not something that we proceed with. You know, that's an absolute, what we call an absolute contraindication. So if somebody has diabetes they cannot proceed. Certain people who have early stages of prediabetes that are, are of a certain age can be permitted to proceed, but full mm -hmm. bone diabetes is a no. Mm -hmm. um, anybody who's going through active treatment for cancer. So there's two aspects to cancer. So if someone is undergoing active treatment for cancer, of course, we want to make sure that they can get through that treatment. And kidney function is often very important to get through treatments like chemotherapy, for example. Mm -hmm. But also we're looking at the safety of the organ being transmitted to a recipient. And sometimes cancer cells can be transmitted from donor to recipient. And so wow. if somebody has active cancer, then there's a, a significant risk of that. And we would not only be potentially putting the donor at risk, we may be putting the potential recipient at risk too. So that's a no. Mm -hmm. Same thing with active infection. Infections can be transmitted from the donor to the recipient. Infections generally have to be treated and completely resolved before donation. And things like heart attack or stroke. So anybody who's had a heart mm -hmm. attack or a stroke is not permitted to proceed. We know that there's a tight relationship between kidney health and heart health. And so we want to make sure that individuals who are going through the donation procedure do not have any cardiac disease. You talked about the cross match earlier, because I think most people think that they can only donate as living donors to somebody that they're related to. But can you kind of walk us through the cross match, the antibodies, all that 
part right. of the process that I remember when I went through it was almost like the starting point, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's probably one of the biggest myths about donation is that you can only donate to a relative. Like you have mm-hmm. to be a relative, You, can, but that's the furthest thing from the truth. In fact, people donate all the time, whether they're, they could be a colleague, they could be a spouse, it doesn't just have to be a relative. So really ultimately what the cross match is doing is it's looking at whether or not there are are antibodies in the blood of the recipient that are always circulating around and they can be there for various reasons, but whether the antibodies are directed towards the the proteins that are on the kidney that you would theoretically be receiving. So you've got a donor yourself donating to your recipient. Does your recipient have antibodies towards these proteins on your kidney? Now, for many people, although they're not genetically the same, they don't have those antibodies that are circulating in which case that would be a negative cross match, right? So there's no antibodies circulating, even though they're not the same genetically, Mm -hmm. there's no reaction there. Now, it's not to say, of course, that antibodies can't develop in the future. And that sometimes does happen after transplantation that the antibodies develop. But what we're looking for here with the cross match is, are there specifically antibodies that are binding to those proteins that would cause rejection of that organ? If you are genetically related, there's certainly a higher probability that a lot of the proteins on the kidney and in your body would be the same. And so there's maybe less likelihood of having antibodies, but there's a lot of people who are genetically related that are completely different at the protein at the molecular level. Right. So for example, two siblings, unless they're identical twins could be very different. Right. Mm -hmm. So these are related individuals, but may not be genetically the same. So really what we're looking for is antibodies and antibody reaction to those proteins. And that's why we can do transplant or transplantations from colleagues, spouses, strangers, is because as, as long as there's no antibodies present, we can proceed with that transplant. And the whole goal of using immunotherapy and medications to suppress the immune system is to prevent the immune system from reacting to something that is not themselves, right? And preventing the development of those antibodies. But the cross match is a a really critical part of it because of course, a lot of people, when they think of donating, they have this idea and this picture in their mind of donating directly to that person. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can take a little bit of an adjustment to say, okay, I can't donate directly. I can still donate and we can talk about the exchange program and how that works. But sometimes it can take a little bit of time to kind of get used to the idea of not being able to donate directly or receiving directly from someone. Mm -hmm. Um, and that can be sometimes hard uh, for, for people at the beginning mm-hmm. to get used to if the cross match is positive. Can you talk a little bit about how that paired exchange program works? Yeah, absolutely. It's such a terrific program. Mm-hmm. It's operated by Canadian Blood Services, and there's just a powerhouse team there that that supports this program and, and runs this program. And it's a Canada-wide program. And basically it's pairs who are not compatible, who go into this, who get enrolled in this program. So either there's antibodies or blood group incompatibility. So donor and recipient aren't the right kind of match from a blood group perspective. These pairs get enrolled in this program and there's people across the country that are in the same predicament. And mm-hmm. what it's trying to do is match up people in order to allow transplants to happen. Mm-hmm but they're just not happening to the intended person, right? So you've got two individuals in Saskatchewan who are incompatible, but maybe the donor in Saskatchewan would be compatible with the recipient in Toronto and the donor in Toronto is compatible with the recipient in Saskatchewan. And there you have a nice exchange. Nobody's donating their kidney directly to the person they planned on it. But at the end of the day with this swap, everybody wins, right? It's not exactly the way that you had thought about it happening, but everybody gets transplanted in the end. And that's Mm -hmm. the ultimate goal. And so the program will create all sorts of, of chains. So it can be a simple swap. It could be multiple swaps of like multiple pairs, or it could be something called the domino chain, which is effectively someone who starts this whole cascade of transplants. And they're someone who starts this cascade of transplants because they're an anonymous donor and they just want to help somebody in need. And They just, they don't have a particular intended recipient in mind. Amazing, amazing people and actually a huge part of the success of the program, but this anonymous donor will trigger this chain of transplants. And ultimately the last transplant that happens in that chain is somebody on the waiting list. So a really amazing thing is working with anonymous donors who are saying, well, I don't have a particular recipient in mind, but I know this is important. I know people need transplants. I want to help somebody in need. doesn't matter who. And not only am I able to help someone by going into the donation program and triggering your chain, your donation can help 
five, six people in need, right? By triggering this chain that otherwise wouldn't have been possible because of incompatibility. So super amazing people that are, that are a key, key part of, of the program. Amazing. Dr. Singh, it's, your smile is obvious when you talk about the optimism behind these procedures. And I'm just wondering, what's it like for you personally, not only as a doctor, but just as a human being, to be part of a team that, as you mentioned earlier, your mentor said, there's two reasons you want to be in the hospital, to have a baby or to have a transplant. Like, <laughs> what's that like for you to be part of something that is so life-affirming? In its yeah. Own way? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's an amazing experience, right? When you are able to, because you're able to see people from their big, the beginning of kind of the process right through to the end. And there's ups and downs in that process. There's no doubt about it. There's kind of periods of excitement when the donor gets cleared and this is going to happen. There's periods of kind of disappointment sometimes if, for example, you're in a chain and it collapses because of logistical issues and things get delayed. So there's lots of ups and downs, but ultimately we've been doing this long enough that we know that just persist and keep at it, we'll get there. And so it's a very kind of a special experience to be through it. Some There's some highs, some lows, but to ultimately know that we can get people to where they need to be and also getting to hear from people after the process, you know, when it's all done and after all of that process and when all of those ups and, ups and downs, you can see that you can get people to what they wanted to do, which was to get off dialysis, get back to normal life, have families, be in the workforce And to be able to hear that after, you know, when I follow up with my donors, I often ask them how they're doing. I'm able to inquire about how their recipients are doing and to hear that everybody is doing well is really special. Mm -hmm. So it's really exciting. I'm speaking for myself today, but I know that my whole team feels this way. And in many ways, our coordinators are even closer to our donors and recipients than we are as physicians Mm -hmm. because they have so many more interactions with them and are really guiding them through that process. We have two fantastic donor coordinators, Melinda and Julie, and the nurse practitioner, Leslie, who are amazing at supporting our donors throughout that process as well. So I know that they also feel that it's a really special experience and, uh, and one that's very unique. I mm-hmm. think there's not that many experiences in medicine where you kind of do that. You follow individuals through time to get them to their ultimate goal. And then mm-hmm. to be able to hear how they're doing afterwards is, is pretty unique. I, I can't think of really anything else where, where it's quite like that. Yeah. I mean, I have now known my nephrologist for 14 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How remarkable it is that you and your team take such good care of us recipients and donors throughout this whole process. It's amazing. Yeah, I think it's really special to be part of it. I mean, it's a very unique and special experience. I know there's some nephrologists in our group who have followed people for 30 plus years. How incredible, right? Now, not all kidneys last that long, but some do. And wow, just yeah, hard to kind of believe, right? It's pretty mm-hmm. it's long. It's a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Singh, what are the benefits of getting an organ from a living donor versus from a deceased one? Because I know that was a question that I had in my journey, being a donor. And uh, I was surprised to hear that generally it's much better in terms of lasting longer. Absolutely. So whenever we see a, a transplant candidate or a potential transplant recipient in our clinics, we always talk about options, deceased donor transplant, living donor transplant, but living donor transplant is really the preferred therapy. Mm -hmm. And really, ultimately, it offers a recipient the highest probability of being alive with a transplant that is working over time. So if you look at how long the kidney lasts from a living donor versus how long it lasts from a deceased donor, it's clear kidneys from living donors last longer. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at a transplant, you're trying to get the maximum amount of time off dialysis, obviously, or if you can avoid dialysis altogether, even better. But really, it comes down to what we call graft survival, the medical term for that. But really, ultimately, it's the likelihood of being alive with a kidney that is working is just greater, better with a kidney from a living donor than a deceased donor. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because we're getting a kidney from a very healthy individual. Mm -hmm. There's effectively not much that needs to be done. The kidney is removed and then generally implanted very soon thereafter. And that's very different than a kidney that's coming from a deceased donor. Most of them have some medical issues, 
Mm. And there's also some changes that can happen around the time of death and dying that can off also affect the quality of that kidney. So ultimately just the quality of the kidney being transplanted is different. And so that accounts for how long the kidney can last. And so that's why we always recommend living donation. And the other thing too, is not only is it helpful to the person receiving the transplant, but it's helpful to everybody actually, because not everybody has a living donor. A lot of people try to find a living donor. They're unable to do so. It's a really hard thing to do and a hard question to ask. Like you can't just really be like, Hey, want to donate? Like these are tough conversations, right? Some people have tried to find a living donor and they have been deemed medically unsuitable. And so what happens is if you've got an individual who has a living donor, what they do is ultimately they're taking themselves off that deceased donor waiting list. So the less people on the deceased donor waiting list, the shorter the waiting time. So everybody benefits because all of a sudden you've got this deceased donor waiting list that's shorter and shorter and shorter. And the time that you have to wait to get a deceased donor organ is shorter. We know for sure that there's still a, a waiting list. Unfortunately, we have not been able to to change that significantly. There is a waiting list for a deceased donor transplant and it can vary tremendously by blood group, blood mm -hmm. group B and blood group O having to wait the longest. And so if there's any way to make that list shorter and to decrease that waiting time, absolutely. It's something that we should try to do. And living donation does just that. You help somebody in need, but you're also helping the population of people on that waiting list as a whole. So huge benefits from the both individual level and then at a population level too. That's fantastic. And when we talk about living donors, what are some of those short-term immediate risks that they might encounter? And then some of those long-term risks that donors might need to think about? Yeah, that's a really good question. A lot of times people say, what is the donor assessment? Well, the donor assessment is ensuring safety and suitability for donation, but also taking all of that information and trying to tailor a risk discussion that is individualized. So everybody is a little bit different. So we try to individualize the risk discussion as much as possible. And so on that spectrum of risk, of course, we all want donors to be in that low risk group. We don't mm -hmm. we think that somebody's at super high risk. We don't proceed with donation, but there is going to be some variation in terms of risk. But part of the discussion is risk. And really the short-term risks and long-term risks generally, although are, are low, they're not zero. I think we can Acknowledge right. there's a, this is a surgical procedure, so we can't ever remove all risk. Mm -hmm. But when we think about risks, short-term risks, anytime there's a general anesthetic involved, there's always a risk of death. Now, fortunately, it's extraordinarily rare. And so I quote people a risk of 0.01 to 0.03%. And so to put that into context, we do things all the time that have a higher risk of death, getting on a plane, getting in a car, driving to work looking at our cell phone when we're crossing the street, <laughs> all of these things are, we don't ever think about them because they're part of our day-to-day -day life. So I often try to put it into a little bit of context because right. it could be a little bit scary to hear like, oh, I might die, but it's extremely unusual. And the reason it's so, so low is because we screen our donors so rigorously, but anytime there is a general anesthetic involved, we have to, we have to discuss that, but the risk is extraordinarily mm -hmm. low. And for example, if you got your gallbladder removed tomorrow, would be at low risk as well. It's kind of very similar to that. Mm -hmm. uh, most donors actually get through donation without kind of any major complications. About 4% of donors will have some sort of complication. By far the most common is infection. Sometimes bladder infections can happen, infections of the skin where the cuts have occurred on the skin, rarely pneumonias from being in hospital. But if those do happen, they are treated with antibiotics, usually about a week course of antibiotics. The other things that can happen are bleeding, which kind of makes sense. We're taking a kidney out with all of its blood supplies. So bleeding can sometimes happen. Usually the bleeding stops on its own. It's internal and most donors don't really feel anything, but in rare circumstances in about one in 500 cases, it's so severe that we do need to give a blood transfusion, but that's very, very rare. Mm -hmm. Blood clots can happen again, also very low likelihood, less than 1%. And uh, Sometimes lung collapse can happen again, very, very rare, again, less than 1%. All of them are manageable and treatable, mm -hmm. uh, but I will say overwhelmingly 96% of our donors will, will experience no complications from the procedure. Oh. Um, they stay in hospital usually three days and we recommend four to six weeks off work just to recover from the procedure. But long-term risks are something that are a little bit more variable. And this mm -hmm. also depends on who the donor is. 
and what age they're at. And you can imagine that if you are young when you donate, there's a lot of years ahead to develop potential problems. Whereas if you donate at a little bit of an older age, there's less years ahead potentially to develop an issue. But so the risk is a little bit different depending on the age of the donor. But overall, the things that we will discuss is there's a slightly higher risk for donors of getting higher high blood pressure after donation. The kidney is so important in terms of salt and water control that sometimes uh, pressure will go up a little bit, but it can lead to a diagnosis of high blood pressure that's a little bit more common in donors versus those who don't donate. Sometimes it's hard to tease out whether or not a donor would have gotten high blood pressure anyways. One in four older adults have high blood pressure, so sometimes it's kind of hard to tease that out. But in the studies that have compared donors and non-donors, there seems to be a slightly higher risk just because you're losing half of your kidney mass. High blood pressure is very treatable. Lots of great medications there to treat blood pressure, so definitely manageable. We know that kidney function doesn't stay the same after donation, which kind of makes sense. We're taking a whole kidney out, but the kidney that that remains in the body does compensate. Can't compensate fully, but does compensate and gets you to about 65 to 70% of your original kidney function. People should feel the exact same with that degree. One of the parts of the assessment process is making sure that you're starting from a good enough level of kidney function that if you, when you do drop to that 65 to 70%, that you feel just fine and everything is the same, right? And that's exactly what we're looking for. We're not leaving people with just borderline kidney function. And then the other thing to keep in mind over the long term is that when you look at the studies, there are there is a small signal that kidney donors have a slightly higher risk of getting kidney failure versus those who do not donate. And so the question then is, why would that be? There's nothing about donation per se that causes kidney failure. So the changes that happen in the kidney after donation are considered benign. But what happens is that sometimes people are exposed over their lifetime to what we call like a second hit. They get diagnosed with diabetes or they have to go th through a bypass surgery. And that can sometimes just cause a kind of a stress or strain on that kidney that remains. And that can cause some deterioration of kidney function. Now, those events are very rare. And kidney donors, although they have a slightly higher risk of getting kidney failure than people who don't donate, it's they're so healthy that the overall risk is super, super low. 50 per 10,000 at 20 years. So 0.5%, really low probability. And the odds are obviously in favor of not getting kidney failure, but it's important to recognize that there is that small signal. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's really important after donation to monitor for those things that can cause kidney function deterioration. So right. we want to make sure that we screen for blood pressure, that we screen for diabetes, all of these things that we want to catch early. So that doesn't happen. That deterioration doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So that's the important, the long-term risks and the risks of these things may be different depending, of course, on the individual, but generally the overall risks are low. We don't typically proceed in scenarios where the risks are beyond the threshold of a donor program, which can vary across the country. Mm -hmm. Not all donor programs are the same in terms of their risk threshold, but certainly these are things that we look at and that we counsel donors on about the long-term mm -hmm. risks. It all sounds very familiar having gone through it, yeah. Dr. Singh. <laughs> The other piece of advice was to keep a healthy weight because sudden weight gain can put a lot of pressure, blood pressure increases in pressure on the kidney and to avoid contact sports because you want to protect the one that you've got. So it's great to reiterate that and to put it in the scope of what is the actual threat versus the theoretical one and what we can do as donors to stay yeah. healthy. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, because you mentioned it earlier, and we've talked about it before too, most people who are going through the process of becoming a donor, they're there because they have to be, and they're there because they're trying to help, and they wish that their family members or their a friend or a colleague wasn't going through this. So there's that inherent stress, obviously, of dealing with a diagnosis, of being screened from head to toe, and potentially finding something wrong with you. Yeah. And I'm wondering... And even donors who go down the road and then are, are deemed ineligible. There's so many emotional pieces in the journeys. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about to how do health centers support donors in that on the emotional piece, which is yeah. in and of itself incredibly huge. Yeah, there's no doubt that it's obviously a process that's filled with emotions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think for a lot of donors, what they find the hardest is kind of the waiting right? Going through this, not being sure of their suitability. They want to know, like, am mm -hmm. I suitable or not? And sometimes it's a straightforward path to get to that answer. Sometimes we need extra tests or opinions and consults to get there. And just that process can be very hard. 
So there was a couple of things. The first is in the program, we do have a social worker that does help in this regard, not only for psychosocial assessments, but if we have donors who want to talk about these emotions that can sometimes come up during the process, but also sometimes they come up after the process, right? So a lot of times the process is so busy. The donor workup process is so busy. Often some donors aren't even processing really what they're feeling because they're so motivated to get there. I got to get to this decision. I've got to go to this consult and that appointment, and I've got to book this, this scan. I've got to go to this visit. And then it's done. And then it's like, oh, I have all of these feelings that sometimes got a little bit suppressed, but sometimes it's not just through the process, it's afterwards too. Mm -hmm. So our social worker in our program is terrific and has been really helpful in, in helping our donors in that regard. But also the other thing that I find helps donors a lot is peer support. So sometimes there's something, I mean, you can talk to health professionals all day long. Sometimes people want to speak to somebody else who has gone through the exact same thing, who have felt the exact same feelings and who understand what it's like to, you know, the, the, for example, if you're going through the evaluation process, it's, that's a, a, an emotional process, but also the emotions that come with seeing someone potentially, if you're donating someone that you know, somebody that you love, going through the process of waiting for a transplant, that can be very hard too, especially if you're intimately close with that person. So our social workers are great, but peer support often seems to be something that donors really feel like they connect with just to talk to somebody else who has been in that position has been really helpful. But sometimes you just kind of need to talk about it with somebody else who's been there. And so yeah, and even just the idea of even donors who are basically, you know, kind of ruled out that mm -hmm. I know, you know, I've heard from and how devastating it is because they're really setting out, like you said, and I know it was the same for me, you're really gung ho about helping. And then when you're kind of like suddenly stopped in your tracks, that can be really tough for people who thought they could help. Yeah. Um, and I, and I bet that's a conversation that I know of people who got there and then the next day it's like, okay, now I'm, I guess that's over. Right. So yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's worth a lot of conversations for sure. I think to support people emotionally on that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The thing that we found in, in our situation that, that really helped to was writing. My mom did a lot of journaling and writing and that she felt that that helped her through the process. And then I actually spoke to a grief counselor. Mm -hmm. So that grief counselor really helped us in talking about grieving the life that we had pre-diagnosis, grieving the life that we had to go through during that time, and then what it's like now to live with what we went through. That's incredible. That's a, that's really interesting that you spoke to a grief counselor, but because that's so astute, right? Because I think that is part of the ups and downs that I went through and that my surgeon warned me that it will happen. That mm -hmm. after you get through that focus, 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 let's get this done, and the elation of it happening successfully, and then you're left mm -hmm. with, as Dr. Singh said, okay, what just happened? Right. And, and it's in those moments that so much going on. And it's really unexpected because you almost feel bad about feeling bad because you're going, but I just did a good thing. And, and the right. outcome was good. So you're trying to reconcile, why am I feeling this way? So mm -hmm. it's really great that you brought that up. Cause you know, now I'm thinking maybe I should go connect with a grief counselor that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. And this conversation with you has helped a lot. And even listening to you again, Dr. Singh reminds me of what it was like going through it not so long ago. It hasn't even been like six months or so. So it's incredible, I think, in terms of uh, emotional care. And if you don't mind, maybe I can just jump to the care, standard of care for donors in terms of follow-ups. I was told mm -hmm. connect with your GP after the fact, after the first couple of meetings with my surgeon. And now I'm being followed by my GP, but is there like a standard type of care that donors across the country are going through or should be going through or could be going through that would result in better outcomes? Yeah, this is a really imp important topic. One that I'm really passionate about because how we think about donor follow-up has changed over time. Mm -hmm. Before these big studies in 2014 came out, we didn't think that there was any significant difference in terms of long-term outcomes to kidney donors. Granted, donors do very well. And I want to stress again that the vast majority of donors will be just fine. Right. But there is that small signal of slightly increased risk of kidney failure, a little bit of risk of hypertension. And we have to just acknowledge that we know this now. And mm -hmm. so the, probably how we do things has to change a little bit. Mm -hmm. Donors are healthy individuals and they don't feel like they're a patient and they aren't really in many ways. Like they, they feel like mm -hmm. they're a person who donated, but 
they don't have a chronic disease, for example. And so that's why a lot of donors would follow up with their family physicians. But how follow-up happens is variable across the country. So some donors are followed with their GPs over their lifetime. Some donors are followed in the transplant program. Some it's a little bit of a mix. Mm -hmm. And we're not aligned across the country. Everybody does things a little bit differently. And we probably should be aligned, right? We have to decide what is the standard of care for all donors and Mm -hmm. we should all do that. And Mm -hmm. so we just had a forum yesterday, actually, to try to get to some sort of consensus across the countries, how should we be following up donors? And and it's not to say that donors shouldn't follow up with their GPs. I mean, we have terrific GPs who can absolutely deliver this care. There's no doubt about it. But what we do need is a better system to know what happens at those follow-up appointments. Because right Mm -hmm. now, you go to your GP and you get diabetes and your GP is managing it superbly. As a transplant program, we have no idea that that's happened. And so we can't track that information. And if let's say something happens in the future and we don't know that it happens, we can't capture that in our database. And so it's really hard then if you don't have the data to do research and figure out like what are the long-term effects of kidney donation to our kidney donors in Canada? We're Mm -hmm. getting a lot of this data from the U.S. All of these big studies came from Norway and the U.S. They're not Canadian studies. And Mm -hmm. I think we can acknowledge that there's differences in kind of country to country delivery of care. And it's important to know what are the long-term effects to donors in Canada. Donors do so well and the adverse events that happen are so rare that we actually do need to collectively as a country come together and capture this data. It's not enough for just Toronto General to do it or Montreal to do it. We have to put it together. Mm -hmm. That was part of this forum too, is to build in as part of the follow-up process is to build into that piece, a consent process to say, Joanna, you've donated your kidney. Are you okay if you sign this consent form that we capture your data on what happens to you after donation so we can learn from it? Mm -hmm. And the more data you have, the more you can then fine tune your, your, when your risk projections, when you're talking to someone, you've got Mm -hmm. data from the Canadian community that you can use to make more accurate estimations of of what the true risks are. We're not looking to reinvent what's being done because a lot of follow-up care is, is excellent. But we're trying to get it uniform across the country, get an agreement so we can capture that vital data Mm -hmm. and have some sort of communication pathways established so we know what happens, right? Right. Or gets COVID or they get hospitalized. It's really good if we can capture that information so we can really understand what's happening. And also, too, if we know those things, there's a lot of things that we can do. There's great new drugs for diabetes that are coming out. We can also then study the impacts of those therapies. But we can't study things if we don't capture the data. Right. And if we don't know what's happening, it's impossible to capture that data. So I think that's what we're trying to achieve with this consensus forum, a standard of care, get it uniform across the country. What are we going to capture? How are we going to capture it? And also, as I mentioned, donors are low risk, but some of them are slightly higher risk than others. So for example, a donor who has high blood pressure or a slightly elevated blood sugar, they're not quite diabetic. Those ones might be in a little bit of a higher risk bracket. And so maybe some of these individuals should be followed more frequently or should be followed at the transplant center, for example. So there's some nuances there. Not all donors are the same. Mm -hmm. By and large, the vast majority actually can continue to follow with their GP. Many of them feel that that's very convenient, actually. Right. They're accessible to them. They can follow up with them regularly. And that's totally great. We just, I think, need a better better system to close the loop, right? Mm -hmm. How do we get people to their GPs, but also stay connected to them? for life, right? Because our Mm -hmm. donors have done an incredible thing. I think it's our responsibility as a community to care for them in the very best way that we can. I feel passionate about it. We have a living donor portal here. We developed understanding that a lot of donors wanted to stay with their their family physicians, which was terrific. We wanted to create at least some sort of digital platform so we can stay connected. So Mm -hmm. we created this living donor portal, which is effectively, it's voluntary, but donors can sign up for it. We're just rolling that out now. Donors can sign up for it. They give us consent, not only to communicate with them through this portal, so we can provide them updates on what's going on in donation or new research that's happening, but it allows them to communicate back with us. I went to see my GP this week this was my blood pressure. I don't have diabetes. I don't have blood pressure. I'm pregnant, these type of things. So we can filter through and keep an eye on our donors at a distance, of course, but Mm -hmm. identify those who may need 
potential specialist support only if needed. And also it allows us to capture some data as well for research. So that portal is something that is possible thanks to philanthropy. The Kearney and Kale families have been incredible supporters of the Center for Living Organ Donation, and they were incredibly supportive of this project and passionate for this project as well. And that's how the portal came to life. So I mm -hmm. think definitely a step forward in trying to stay connected. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to see our donors every year because our donors are doing well and living their lives and doing great right. things in the world. But to stay connected with them digitally just seemed certainly possible and is very kind of the modern thing to do. We're really proud of that. And I think it's a really exciting thing for our UHN donors to have access to. That is extremely exciting. Yeah, that's fantastic. You brought up pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Is there any risk to either males or females in the future for their reproductive health if they've donated that kidney? Yeah, terrific question. I get asked this all the time. Mm -hmm. So fertility is not impacted by donations. I oft often get asked, will it hinder my ability to get pregnant? Mm -hmm. Will I still be able to father a child? All of those things are completely unaffected by donation. So fertility is the same. Okay. Now, what does change though is for pregnancy, there are some considerations. So what may happen during pregnancy is that there is a slightly higher risk of developing high blood pressure or preeclampsia, which is a condition where often the baby needs to be delivered because the blood pressure is going up and the body's shutting down a little bit during pregnancy. And so there's a slightly higher risk of donors getting gestational hypertension or blood pressure during pregnancy or preeclampsia. The big study that actually showed this was published using Ontario data. Hmm. And uh, so it was really a lot of local impact for what they found in that study, Dr. Garg led that study, is that the risk of preeclampsia or gestational hypertension was about two times higher in donors. So about 11% in donors compared to about 5% for people who don't donate. So okay. numerically, 11% is, there's no doubt about it, it's higher than 5%. Mm -hmm. It's still what we feel is within the realm of acceptable risk. But we always recommend that obviously that donors are monitored throughout their pregnancy, their practitioner would be aware of this. And that's something that we can certainly manage. And we don't ever decline donation based on the desire to get pregnant, right? So this, okay. this is not a, you want to get pregnant, you can't donate. That, that's not at all what we do. What we do is discuss the risks involved. Everybody has a different threshold too for risk. Mm -hmm. And some people want to get the donation done with at a certain time. Sometimes time frames aren't really negotiable. But we do discuss the risks, but we don't make the decision for the donor or the potential donor. That's one that, that the donor has to make for themselves. And we provide the information to help support the individual through their decision. Now, that study showed that although there's a slightly higher risk of having blood pressure issues during pregnancy, there is no increased risk of maternal death, fetal death, low birth weight. So all of those things are unchanged or are not at all this affected, right? So these are things that we just recommend get monitored closely during pregnancy, but certainly is not a contraindication to proceeding. Mm -hmm. It's something that is just an additional layer of discussion and risk discussion that, that we have with our donors. That's great. That's fantastic to know. Yeah. Dr. Singh, you talk a lot about need for research and evidence-based research, right? And I'm curious if you can speak to innovations in the future for both recipients and donors. And I understand um, that the Ajmera Transplant Center and UHN are leading the way in innovation. So can you speak a little bit about what we can expect? Everything from universal blood type to even mechanical kidneys or animal organs like where is the future and how close is it yeah great question there's tons of amazing stuff happening here that's one of the the wonderful things of being part mm -hmm. of this group and being part of the center is just getting inspired by the people who are around you so many amazing scientists and physicians and uh, coordinators and social workers doing amazing work so i think one of the things that is really exciting as you've probably heard about is there's this ex vivo technology, which is the ability to repair organs before they are transplanted. So not all organs obviously are usable when they come out of the donor, this is for a donor that deceased donor particularly, but in particular, this is technology that has been led by our colleagues in the lung transplant program, Dr. Kishaji, Dr. Saipel, Dr. Selzner in the liver and kidney transplant world of this ex vivo technology, which is the ability to put a kidney on the circuit outside of the body, repair it, 
wow. optimize it before it goes back into the body. And that's been really exciting. And I think UHN has definitely led the way in that regard. It's really impressive to see what my colleagues are doing here. My personal view as where things are also going that are really exciting is how we use these really new blockbuster drugs that are coming out. For a long time, there was very little that we could use to try to treat diabetes or kidney disease or heart disease for that matter. But there's these new drugs that have come out called SGLT2 inhibitors, which are now been shown to protect the heart, protect the kidneys, and be really beneficial in terms of keeping people living longer and off dialysis. And so how these drugs will change the landscape of transplant is an area that I'm really interested in. Unfortunately, transplant patients are often excluded from these big studies, right? So these big studies that test these drugs often don't include immunosuppressed patients. And what a shame because because transplant patients have a higher degree of heart disease. And also grafts, we know kidney transplants don't work forever. And we, our ultimate goal is try to make them last forever, right? One kidney for the lifetime of the patient. And so I think where we can try to improve those outcomes is to use these drugs, test them in our transplant recipient population. Because I personally believe that they have a tremendous potential for impact and for benefit there. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm currently leading a trial on this in the kidney transplant population where we're looking at SGL2-2 inhibitors in kidney transplant recipients, making sure they're safe and they work. I just received another grant to study the combination of SGLT2 inhibitors with another new type of drug that's used for treatment of diabetes and obesity called a GLP-1 receptor agonist, like Ozempic. Mm -hmm. uh, so combining those two together and seeing how they can help our transplant recipients as well is an area of major interest. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to try to help our transplant recipients live longer, live better, and mm -hmm. have their organs live, last longer by using these drugs that are now really coming out, showing themselves to be very, very beneficial. I think they have a tremendous potential in transplant. So that's where I'm focusing my efforts and and I know that there's also lots of other amazing things, obviously, going on here. Just really exciting to see. Mm -hmm. And on those other points, too, Dr. Singh, about the uh, creating a universal blood type and how far are we from other types of organs coming from animals, for example, or mechanical organs. I know that probably sounds too sci-fi, but I hear about that. I, I get questions about that all the time. Yeah, so there's definitely lots of active research on the universal blood type. There was a proof of, proof of principle paper that was published on that by uh, Dr. Seipel here. There's lots of groups who are working actively on the transplantation of animal organs. So heart transplants from animals into humans, kidney transplants, artificial organs as well. Many, many groups are working on these issues. There's, of course, ongoing development. I don't think we're quite ready for prime time just yet. There's still kind <laughs> of ongoing work needed in terms of making this a sustainable long-term solution. But it's certainly really exciting stuff that I think is going to be part of our future, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, the when part, obviously, it requires going from proof of principle to early clinical trials to larger clinical trials. So there's definitely a stepwise approach. And that's science and discovery in general, right? Sometimes people think it's like this one big discovery and everything changes. But in reality, behind the scenes, it's progress, hard work, mm -hmm. inching forward over years, over decades, until we get to these uh, major technologies. And for example, these drugs that are coming out, people have been studying this receptor that this drug works on, this SGLT2 inhibitor receptor for years. And it's been a lot of work for many years in the past to get to this point. Mm -hmm. And so that's often what discovery is, just a lot of a lot of work behind the scenes to get to that point. Sounds very optimistic though. And I'm sure people will appreciate hearing that listening to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a, and a shameless plug, if people are interested in learning more about the universal blood type or even xenotransplant, we did a couple interviews at the CST Banff conference that people can listen to either on the podcast or on YouTube. There's a bunch of short videos about all of the amazing innovation that's happening at UHN and outside. And then also there's a playlist just about innovation that people can, who are interested in that kind of stuff can look at. And definitely, if you haven't listened to some of the other podcast episodes, we talk a lot about the ex vivo machine in our lung transplant episode and in our liver episodes too. So it's just fascinating stuff with all of these people who are, like you said, working 
all together on different projects to move the needle so quality of life is better, so that transplants are better, so that overall our journey as patients and donors are so much better. So it's it's fascinating to hear about everything that's happening that we don't often hear about because it's all happening so, so much and daily, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's great. I've seen them all on the channel. I think it's it's terrific for people to check out. Yeah. I do have one question for both of you, but uh, before I ask that, is there anything else that you want to speak about in regards to donors or the kidney community? Well, I just first want to say thank you to the two of you for <clears throat> allowing me to do this. It's really wonderful for us as healthcare providers to hear your perspective. Candace is a recipient, Joanna as a donor, your stories are so powerful and we always know why we're doing this, but mm -hmm. the stories really are ultimately at the center. And so to be able to hear your perspective, to talk to people who are going through it, have gone through it, and for us to be part of that journey is a real honor and privilege. And so thank you for, for sharing your stories, for being part of these, these type of opportunities, because hearing your stories are really, is really special for us. And and really meaningful. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Candice. I, th I thank you both because to me, as I mentioned to Candice earlier, it's a real privilege to be able to talk about this with people who are in the know or at least kind of directly affected by transplantation. And it was my motivation to sharing my story publicly, even as a journalist, it was to bring this story to a wider audience. And I really hope these podcasts do that because so much of transplantation is based on hope. And how often can you say that? And it is such an incredibly powerful thing to offer to people who need it and to people who can help. So I'm so glad that, Candice, you reached out. And I'm so glad to have met you, Dr. Singh. It reminds me about my own journey and, and how important it is that we all remember the humanity behind it for everybody involved. Absolutely. I do have one more question for you both, but I'm going to echo what you both said. Thank you so much, Joanna, for sharing your journey with us and and being so open and vulnerable about what you and your family have gone through. And I know hearing more stories about people who have been through it are, is going to help patients and families going through it and donors who have questions. So thank you for being part of today and for being part of our Great Actions Leave a Mark campaign as well. And I encourage people to go in and watch Joanna's video as well, because it's amazing. And Dr. Singh, thank you so much for all of your support always and engaging in our webinars and today in our podcast and all of the great information that you share, because it's incredibly important for us patients and donors and families to get to hear from you first thing. So thank you for taking the time today, because I know there's not a lot of it to spare. <laughs> it's been wonderful to be here. Thank you. <clears throat> so to leave off, I'm wondering if you could tell me if you could be any tree, what type of tree would you be? You know, that is Okay. It's so freaky. I would be an <laughs> olive tree. And the reason I'm Greek, olive trees are huge and that they're, that we've got tons of them yes. on, our, on our home in Greece, but they're a symbol of endurance and strength and kind of resilience. And I remember reading something to help me through some of the more ups and downs in this, in these last few months. And I remember reading a book saying, pick a symbol that will put your mind to and bring your anxieties to. And I picked the olive tree. So your question is really serendipitous. It's really lovely that you brought that back because I wasn't expecting it. But it's funny that I did, I did actually think of a tree as, a, as a symbol to look at when I was needing a little bit of grounding. So, I would be an olive tree. That's the short answer. Beautiful. <laughs> wow. Thank you. And yourself, Dr. Singh? Wow. Um, I was not prepared for that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say palm tree because whenever I think of a palm tree, I'm thinking of it's always like happy thoughts, right? You're just mm -hmm. not to say that life is always easy, but <clears throat> kind of turns to being in a good place, being relaxed, being happy. And so just to have that, that I think that's helpful to keep that positive perspective mm -hmm. at all times, even when things are difficult. And so that's the tree that I will choose because I always think of positive things when I think of a palm tree, very relaxing and happy and makes me think of holidays. So I'm going to pick that one. Amazing. I love it. Positivity. Thank you so much. Both of your trees are so incredibly uh, symbolic to both of who you are. That's fantastic that you picked them. So again, thank you so much, both of you, for being part of today. We're very grateful for everything that you do and uh, have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you.
And don't forget to subscribe to Living Transplant Podcast wherever you're accessing this today. Please share with your friends. And if you have any ideas for future podcast episodes, you can reach out to us at livingorgandonation at uhn.ca. And for more information on living organ donation, you can visit us at www.livingorgandonation.ca. Thank you for listening.